A little while ago, I did a review of the Avid Sigson, an integrated amplifier. And in that particular review, I talked about the phono amplifier as being a symbol of the good quality surrounding this particular uh, Avid amplifier. And the fact that inside was a phono amplifier, which sounded superb. And it was sort of symbolic of the whole design, really. During that particular review, I said that this was only the second time that I could point to a built-in phono amplifier and say that was a cracking amplifier. And I've had a few other people come to me and say, okay then, so what is it? What's this other, what is this other product that you like with the built-in phono amplifier? And it's the Moon 390 network player and also pre-amplifier. There's no power amplification within the chassis itself. You will need a separate power amplifier to get this whole thing going. But this £5,000 piece of kit is amazingly good. It is excellent. It's not perfect, and we'll talk about some of those imperfections during this particular video, but it is highly recommended. I'll tell you now, you can cut to the chase straight away here. The Moon 390 is intriguing because you could call this an all-in-one. Now, all-in-ones, as far as the hi-fi industry are concerned, are flavour not of this month, not of even this year or last year, probably the year before that too. But hi-fi, the hi-fi industry sees all-in-ones as a great thing because it's a great way to hedge your bets. You're going to appeal to far more people, in their eyes anyway, you're going to appeal to far more people if you cram all kinds of goodies in the one chassis. More people are going to pick up the box if you have an amplifier and a phono amplifier and a headphone amplifier and maybe a streamer in there and who knows, stick a CD transport in there too and goodness knows what else. Generally speaking, all-in-ones offer great value. They pack an awful lot of uh, features, an awful lot of uh, technology into one chassis. So normally you will save money because of this. Also the footprint of an all-in-one is reduced. So instead of having a separate chassis for an amplifier and then maybe one for say a CD player and then one for a separate phono amplifier and then another one for a separate streamer and so on. All of those things are combined, compacted into one easy to use, easy to place chassis. It's all neat and tidy and low footprint and as I say because of that combination because you remove the, the extra chassis and the, all the bits that go with them and the knobs and the switches and what have you, the budget, the bill, the cash needed to pay for all these bits comes way down and you've got a very good value for money piece of technology. The bad thing and the issue I have with it is when you stuff, and I've said this before but I'll say it again, when you stuff lots of technology, I mean different technology, technology that does different jobs, when you stuff all of these items into one chassis, the principal problem is the electronic noise that comes from each of these separate technologies. Electronic noise migrates. It leaches. It can leach and migrate through the air. It can go through circuit board traces. It can travel along inner wiring. It can come from capacitors. It can come from power supplies. And so it resistors, all kinds of items inside the chassis and it will infect, it'll leach, it'll leak and infect other pieces of technology in that chassis. And what that does, this high frequency noise that's created, it can veil and mask delicate detail. So basically it's reducing the quality of your sound. I'm a great believer in separating all of this technology in their own chassis. Just the mere fact that it's separated, that there's a distance between technology A and technology B lowers this intrusive high frequency noise. So, I mean, there's other things too, but just the distance itself is a big help. So yes, all-in-ones tend to be not exactly my favorite thing, but, but if you have a designer who will spend time and apply care and attention to the design, you can end up with amazing results. That's what Moon has done with the 390. It has gone way overboard in terms of care and attention. And it's produced, in my opinion, a little mini masterpiece in all-in-one terms, that is. 
Sometimes when I'm testing, nameless for now, please, all in ones, I want to reach for earplugs. You know, it's not always a very pleasant experience. That aggressiveness which comes from leaching and leaking high frequency noise which invades all the bits of the all-in-one. You can really hear that, and it's not pleasant. It's not pleasant. With Moon's 390, never an issue, never a problem. It's such a rarity. So I had to tell you about the Moon 390. So let's address the question as to why Moon decided not to put a power amp inside the chassis. I asked them and they said this to me. They said, and I quote, sometimes companies chuck in an amp that's not particularly well developed or they shoehorn an amplifier into the real estate that they're left with in the product. So you see, Moon recognized that at the level of the 390, this is a 5,000 pound box. They didn't want to compromise the sound by putting a power amplifier in it a massive toroidal power amplifier, which will spew out high frequency noise, which will mask sound quality. So you can see Moon has been very careful here about what goes in and does not go in the 390 chassis. And when it comes down to a power amplifier, they draw the line in terms of high-end audiophile hi-fi. Now, if you look at the busy rear panel, you may be interested to know that everything connected to these sockets is located in the rear 50% of the casework. Nothing is at the front except hardware relating to the front of the unit. The reason? To create a short signal path. Internally, there is a second casework for isolation purposes. The power supply is within that. The 390's power supply is interesting. It begins in switch mode to allow it to be used in any territory in the world. So there's a reason for this switch mode first stage. From there, the Moon Hybrid Power Supply, as it's called, produces its own analog linear power supply. I asked Moon about this and they said to me, and I quote, that is one of the things that modern supplies of power are plagued with at the moment, mostly because the grids are saturated. You're also getting noise ripples on the mains created by so many people now using little wall wart power supplies for their phone chargers, laptops, TV, USB lamps, and whatever. Also inside is a separate little daughter board, which holds the Mind 2. The Mind 2 is the streamer. That's, that's where the streaming comes from. And again, there's a certain amount of isolation between the streamer and everything else, which is a good thing. Also, because it's a daughter board, you can actually upgrade the streamer itself. So there's a Mind 2 in the 390, and if there's a Mind 3 or a Mind 4 or a Mind 5, you can actually upgrade the chip itself, which is useful. At the rear of the 390, you'll find a couple of Wi-Fi aerials. There's a Bluetooth aerial, but if you look at the front of the 390, you'll see those two cheeks, which seem to bulge either side. Inside one of those cheeks, which is plastic and not metal, is where the Bluetooth aerial is fitted. At the beginning of the video, I mentioned the built-in phono amplifier. Now, this particular phono amplifier is derived from the 810, which is a very expensive piece of kit, and I'm not suggesting that there's an 810 in the 390. There isn't, but it's derived from the 810. It's basically a cut-down version of the 810. But the phono amplifier has its own power supply. It also has its own isolation. So it's a separate entity within the 390's chassis. It's the same with the built-in headphone amplifier. That, again, is isolated and separated from everything else in the 390's chassis. All the digital inputs on the rear run a 32-bit 384 and DSD256 via an ESS DAC Pro chipset. USB is fully asynchronous. There's also a USB host socket to attach a thumb drive. Uh, the content information for that drive is then listed on the associated app, and I'll get to that in a second, but it's a nice touch. There's also a healthy supply of HDMI inputs for smart TV and Blu-ray use. This turns the 390 into a two-channel AV amplifier. The HDMI sockets are, again, fully isolated and they are 4K compatible. The 390 itself is Rune ready and has facilities such as Tidal, uh, Deezer, Cobos, if I pronounce it correctly, TuneIn and the rest. It's an excellent 
piece of kit and I highly recommend it and you can use it without any issues at all. But just be aware of one or two little quirks which I noticed during the review. I would say that the internal technology of the 390, the actual hardware itself, is, if anything, over-engineered. And I think that's brilliant. I think that's wonderful. And you don't often see that with hi-fi technology these days. The interface of the 390 does leave one or two things to be desired, I must admit. Firstly, if you're going to include Bluetooth in a product, any product, then the ability to pair that Bluetooth with your phone or other device should be plain, simple, and easy to do. Some products send out an automatic pairing signal, so you must open your phone settings, for example, and click on the Hi-Fi device, and you're immediately connected. Other technologies use a pairing button. I'm sure you're familiar with that. The pairing facility or button should be labeled, standalone, and quick to access. Most manufacturers see this, even those proffering low-cost items. Moon, though, buries the pairing process in the nested setup menus accessed via the front fascia screen, sitting cheek by jowl with the likes of settings for the phone amplifier gain, setting up a DNLA network, and the like. And I think that's an issue, because Bluetooth, no matter what you might think of it, even if it's in this high-end piece of kit, Bluetooth I see as a lifestyle feature. It's not a nerdy thing. Bluetooth is inherently not about network addresses and dip switches and geeky magic. It's supposed to be simple and easy to access. That's the whole point of Bluetooth. Moon should have backed off and clearly labeled a Bluetooth pairing button on the chassis and the remote or an automatic sensing system to do it for you, but they did not. Also, the Bluetooth pairing command times out after 40 seconds or so. If you're distracted, you'll have to go through the entire nested menus system all over again. Finally, when Bluetooth does pop up on your device, it takes its own sweet time to do it. My iPhone was all of six inches from the 390 and it took a long 10 to 15 seconds to connect. And I expected better than this. Second irritation, the nested menu itself. My problem is, why is it even there? I'm paying 5K for this thing. Create something easy for me to use and make it workable from the chassis and the remote. Add a few more knobs and switches if you really have to. Give me a pictorial app with lots of hand-holding and idiot-proof directions. For a product like this, there should be zero under the hood work. What I wanted Moon to do was think like Apple. I wanted obvious, I wanted simple, I wanted direct. And instead, when I was using this front fascia nested menu thing, I felt like I was being transported back to the 70s. It was very geeky and cardigan wearing. And that's not where we're at. This is 2020, for goodness sake. So for example, the built-in phono amp I mentioned and I still love, it took seven clicks to adjust the gain of the phono amp. Seven. I shouldn't be doing that. I would rather even tackle the dreaded dip switches than do that. There should really be some sort of knobs and flicky switches on the rear or somewhere. Now look, I'm criticizing Moon for these interface issues. It's not a massive issue. They're irritations. They're not something to put me off the 390, which I think is wonderful, and I think you should buy immediately. But these are something that you, things you should be aware of, I think. Little irritations, as I say. Now, I mentioned the app earlier, and that is called the Mind app. And you can install that on your phone or tablet device, and it works very nicely. And when I got that up and running, I immediately went to tune in and linked to a station, a radio station called Demon FM, listened to some R&B and also some rock. And the stream itself was an MP3 stream at 320 kilobits per second, which is fine. So it's a high-end MP3, but still an MP3. So I wanted to listen to an MP3, see how this high-end box handled a lossy file, a lossy stream. And this was a, a, a Wi-Fi connection, let me add. And when I listen to any MP3 or lossy file over Wi-Fi or even Bluetooth, I normally experience some sort of edge, a brightness, some sort of harsh upper mid-range attack, which is not particularly nice. With the 390, I didn't get that. Okay, treble was a little bit rolled off. The upper mids were blunted, rather. Bass was a little bit warm. But you expect this with an MP3 stream. This is not the 390's fault, it's the stream itself. But how the 390 
actually processed the stream. The MP3 stream came over in quite a cuddly, approachable, non-aggressive manner. Very listenable indeed. I was pleasantly surprised with just how listenable the MP3 stream was. Had no issues at all and never once did I wince and go with that sort of harshness. That was a good start because I saw the MP3 stream as a bit of a baptism of fire, I suppose. Continuing with the Mind app, I was able to plug in a USB stick and access it directly via the app with the app stick's contents listed in full on the app itself. What I did notice was and on the app, I was unable to bounce directly between tracks on the USB menu screen, despite all the available tracks appearing on my phone's screen. That is, if I played track one, then tapped on track two, nothing would happen. To move from one track to another, I had to back out of the track screen to the main library menu, then go back into the USB screen, whereupon the USB stick would be rescanned. At this point, I could play track two. That was a bit clunky, as I say, for an app. Once up and running though, the output from the USB stick at this high resolution was excellent. I was very happy with this. Soundstage was very wide, a much more involved sonic output, lots of air and space around the mid-range. So it's quite rich in quality. But again, high resolution files, too easy, eh? So I thought I'd give it another test, another test for the 390. So I sent a Bluetooth file from my iPhone. It was uh, Marvin Gaye, I think it was. And I was very impressed with the results. Yes, there was a smearing to the mids here from the lossy stream with a typical pinched treble and bass that had the lossy file feeling a bit constipated. But nevertheless, the results were relatively open, spacious, even had a pseudo 3D effect to the soundstage, which lifted an eyebrow, I can tell you. In fact, the soundstage was beautifully ordered, offering a very mature aspect. Then I tried analog and I went to the phono amplifier which as, as I say is built in and you already know the results of this because I've gone on and on about it in the past but I played it was Nancy Wilson so it was a little bit laid back jazz vocal over an orchestral background it was brilliant it was as good as if not much better than many external phono amplifiers I've heard in the past it was an amazing experience. It was mature, rich in tone, with a restrained yet significant detail. I was most impressed by the breadth and complexity of the soundstage that provided a rich and lucid presentation. Next, I tried a digital music player. In my particular case, it was an Ashton and Kern AK120. It's a little bit old now, but it's still a very popular and great sounding digital music player. I pushed some Bob Marley through that into the optical port at the rear of the 390 and that was I Shot the Sheriff actually at 24 bit 96k. Here I was happy to hear a level of clarity that I really hear on streaming and digital players. For example, the lyrics from Marley later in the song tend to be muffled enough to prevent me hearing what he's saying. Not with the 390. Marley's diction was enhanced and focused and so for the first time I could actually hear what he was singing about. Next up I plugged an external CD drive into the rear of the moon and uh, this one was a Lima. It was a Lima Elements. The CD drive itself is about £1,200 give or take and I played a mixture of jazz and also rock on this particular test. CD play was beautifully considered. Again that broad and spacious soundstage was heard. The output was disciplined with no nasties in terms of treble, mid-range and bass. I then moved from single-ended RCA to balanced connections because you've got balanced options on the rear of the 390 as well. The result, noise dropped away like a dead weight. The mid-range sounded smooth while bass was strong. It integrated perfectly to provide a naturalistic yet forceful foundation to the song as a whole. Now the one thing I've neglected to tell you is that at this particular point I tested the 390 connected itself to a preamp. And then from the preamp, the signal then went to a pair of monoblocks, valve monoblocks in this case. So 390 preamp, power amp. That's how I've been testing it to this point. What I did for the next part of the test was to take away my preamp. So what you then had was the Moon 390 connected straight to my monoblocks. 
with a direct connection. So how did that sound? Plugging the 390 directly into my monoblocks offered all of the detail, space and air, but with an output that extended the upper mids, extended the treble and the dynamic reach as a whole. The precision was just right, the focus was bang on, the transparency positively delicious and the tonal balance was top notch. Basically, what I'm trying to say is that taking that preamp out, connecting the 390 directly to a power amplifier was just a leap in terms of sonic quality. And that's the way I would configure the 390. I would take a 390 and connect it directly, directly to a power amplifier or a pair of monoblocks. So how would I use the 390? Well, you can use it in two ways. As I have done, you can see the 390 principally as a network player, a complex digital hub in many ways. And you would then connect that to a preamp and then your preamp to your power amp or your 390 just to an integrated amplifier, one or the other. And that's fine and you can do that. But if you really want to up the ante in terms of sound quality, and you're spending £5,000 on a 390, so you really should maximise its capabilities. What I would do instead is have a 390 and connect it directly to a power amp, and then you will get the most from this box, and it really is a beautiful box to listen to. So, grab a 390, you've got that network player built in, all the other bits and pieces are there too, connect that directly to a power amplifier, and you've got a great system, a great network system, a great digital system, which sounds just wonderful. Highly recommended. I think the 390 is an absolute winner. I will stop there. Thank you for watching this rather long video, but there was a lot to talk about with the 390. Until next time, I hope you join me then on the next video. Bye bye for now.